I think uh, because having chosen, you know, like uh, epigenetic clock as the outcome that you were looking at, then that must have, uh, you know, uh, impacted the, the your strategy for the interventions that you were going to use. And I would like to kind of dive into each one in detail, but from a high level, you 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 were thinking of like basically anything that would impact the uh, epigenetic. Well, I guess the epigenetic methylation, right? Yeah, specifically, we were zeroing in on DNA methylation, or we are zeroing in on DNA methylation. We're hedge we were hedging our bets <laughs> right. strongly. So the right. diet is very, very rich in methyl diners, hmm. um, as rich as we could possibly pack them in. You're eating a ton of greens in the diet. If you are willing to, we want you to eat liver. I mean, basically liver a few times, you know, a few times a week, it's a, it's a, it's a multivitamin in a uh, food matrix. Um, it's mm. extraordinarily potent. Um, eggs, you know, for choline, beets, but, you know, for, for betaine. So everything in our intervention was calculated to nudge methylation favorably. Um, we also used, as you would have read in our, our paper, you know, a class of nutrients that, that we've sort of colloquially, colloquially termed uh, methylation adaptogens, but they're, they're, um, primarily polyphenols. They're not all polyphenols, but they're nutrients that seem to be able to really influence where a methyl group is placed on DNA. And right. so these, so, so we're, we're not just pouring in methyl donors. We're not mm. just pouring in a high dose B12 and, and, and folate. Uh, we're pouring in methyl donors in a food matrix, which is safe and, and beneficial uh, across the board. And then we're concurrently supplying the body with a lot of important information in the form of these extraordinary polyphenolic compounds that help to direct the traffic of the methyl, the methyl donors that, that, that we've provided in the diet. And that combination is, um, we, I, think, I, th I think, just really quite extraordinary and exciting. So it's giving, so it's nudging methylation. We know actually, uh, as we age, sort of, if you look at DNA methylation, there's a global trend towards hypomethylation. So mm -hmm. we do see that change, except that we also know very clearly that when you drill down and, and, and look at certain genetic, you know, regions, we'll see hypermethylation happening very specifically, um, generally on genes that we don't want off. And then we see hypomethylation also happening generally on genes that we want on. I mean, it's like the exact opposite of a uh, younger uh, methylome template. Uh, and so we think the combination of, of, of donors plus these traffic directors in the form of these important polyphenols is what gives um, our diet the the juice. It's also though a very anti-inflammatory. It's um, uh, hypoallergenic. It's um, you know low glycemic. We we encouraged uh, you know mild intermittent fasting. We want it to be a little bit keto leaning. I think ketones are also beneficial in it, on the epigenome. Right. So there was a couple of things I wanted to kind of dive into on that. So. Uh, yeah, so one thing you, you said it was yeah, a low glycemic index. And, and so you specifically called out not wanting to have, uh, I guess, big swings in the, the blood sugar level. Because so that negatively affects the epigenetic makeup. DNA methylation. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah it, yes, it does. Um, at the time, it, the, the bulk of the studies were in um, animals, but you can see sort of a single high glucose glucose exposure, altering DNA methylation patterns for uh, the length of, I'm thinking of one trial, the, the, the length of the trial itself, the, the patterns were still changed. So one, one big exposure can have lasting effect. Um, that's got, not going to be as profound in humans, but um, the, the reality is that that higher blood sugar is going to push aberrant DNA methylation patterns. Right. Do you, this is kind of, uh, do you see that different people react differently to different, I guess, foods with sugar, with glucose in them and have different kind of glucose responses? 
Um, that's a great question. And I would say anecdotally with a small um, group, for sure, mm. you know, myself included. And, it, you know, and, it, and it's different after I've just done high intensity interval training versus wake up versus at night versus when I'm stressed out versus whether I've slept or not. So there's a lot of variables that are going to influence that. We would love to look at our intervention with continuous glucose monitors on our participants. I don't know that we know, I think we're still learning what continuous glucose monitors mean. I actually have one on myself. Um, uh, We're still learning about them, but yeah. I, 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 yes, I think, um, yeah, what you're saying is correct. Probably, probably. Okay, so I noticed that you didn't have uh, legumes or grains. You said like, well, discouraged, I guess, rather than completely banned. Uh, So why particularly did you they were, they were banned. They were completely they were banned. Completely banned. Really. Yeah, okay. they weren't just discouraged. <laughs> um, only for this eight-week period, really, only for this eight-week period. And again, it goes back to, you know, glycemic cycling and, and how peop- how some people respond. Though. So there's two reasons. Um, a piece, the, the, the reason includes um, changes to, uh, the, you know, variability and glycemic response and also... Um, in some cases are, can legumes, so in a, in a standard American individual um, who's arguably biased towards inflammation already, um, can legumes push that inflammatory milieu forward? In somebody who has intestinal permeability and dysbiosis, can legumes actually um, be problematic? I think the answer is, in a, in a, in a, in a small percentage, I think the answer is maybe. And, there, and, and the same goes with, with grain. Um, we do see more inflammatory responses to grains. Now, I also want to throw out there, though, that I'm, I'm fully aware of the, of the awesome Blue Zone data and that people living a long time eat loads of legumes and whole grains, et cetera. Um, we're big fans of them. We decided to keep them out of this eight-week program, though, just to be you know, really kind of as clean and hypoallergenic um, as possible, you know, and low glycemic as possible. Um, that said, you know, again, we used, we've used this in practice for years. After people finish doing that intensive, we absolutely want them to migrate on to a broader diet and, and legumes should be, should be in there. Right, because that, that was one of my questions. Uh, absolutely, with- it's been a huge question. Was this like a long-term thing or? uh, or? Yeah, good question. Yep. You know, I think for some of us, it's absolutely can be long-term. We haven't obviously collected data on it. I generally eat, that is generally my dietary pattern. I find it Mm. it works well with me. I feel good on it. Um, Although I do add in uh, legumes. Okay. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.